All right. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Wine, Women, and Words. I am Michelle, and with me, of course, is Diana. Hello. And this evening, we are just, it's going to be a giant nerd session. I, I foresee it happening. Uh, we are joined by author Saricia Glass, who is going to be discussing uh, her latest novel, Game On. Thank you so much for making some time for us and coming to hang out tonight. We're so happy to have you. Thank you for having me. So for our listeners who may not yet be familiar with Game On, can you give us an overview of what the story is about? Basically, um, Samara is a, a, a gamer who calls out this gaming company for problematic content. And the CEO of said uh, gaming company um, finds out uh, that she did it, checks his stuff, and finds out that she's absolutely correct, and then uh, makes her an offer she can't refuse to come on board and affect some change. So they go from being temporary adversaries to allies to friends and then on to more. So <laughs> Gotta love it. The better world, yeah. You know, for me, this uh, it, first time I saw or read about the book, the premise and everything, I immediately thought of feminist frequency. With her, the videos are still online, but she was a major critiquer of the video gaming industry, and she had all these videos talking about um, all the sexist tropes, and she focused on mainly the sexism within video games. And anybody who has seen a video game cover can see some of these some of those tropes but she even went into like the tropes itself like the damsel in distress and all of that so when you were crafting your characters how much research did you do going into that world and dealing with that sort of thing i spent uh, a lot of time on twitch um i and also on the former bird app and just was listening in, uh, listening to conversations and joining in on conversations about uh, with female gamers about how the, their experiences were um, gaming on different platforms and, um, you know, the hate rating that went on, um, especially with gamers of color, uh, black female gamers. So that's, uh, I don't want to say made it easy for me to set my book that way. But yeah, I know that, you know, a lot of books around gaming deals with, you know, a team or trying to make a team and, you know, being unwelcome on the team. So I just wanted to kind of have it be that, but be a little bit more. Um, so calling out the problematic content um, based on what I had seen and uh, interacted with on social media. Pretty much yeah. Like yeah. Cause if you can't tell I'm a gamer myself, I was actually playing video games before we went on the uh, air today and it's it's definitely something that i think the community and the gaming industry has to deal with and they've in some ways it's better now some ways right. but in a lot of ways it can just be a whole lot worse i mean i was reading an article in preparation for the questions and uh, the adl said there's like racism was like higher has been raised amongst many of the communities within the gaming industry. Well, people think that you're taking away their toys or taking away their seat and and relegating them to the very, very back of the bus to steal a, a, a phrase. Uh, and they don't like that. They don't like the idea that something being taken away from them when nothing is being taken away from them. It's like, no, we're just putting more chairs up to the table. You still have your seat. We're just inviting more people in. More people are joining. And it just, it you're not going to run out of food. You're not going to have to shift down to the end of the table. You don't have to move to the children's table either. You have your seat. We're just letting other people sit at the table. And I don't know that. Be yeah, I sometimes I just feel like some people do need to move to the children's table just because of the behavior or the way they act. <laughs> well, yeah, the angry toddler syndrome does seem to <laughs> strike quite a bit. Yes. And one of the other things that I adore about this is the enemies to lovers trope. That's one of my favorite tropes in romance. I think everybody. Everybody has a favorite trope, and I, I think that one is my, by far my favorite. I like that one, too. I can understand why you like 
would like that because it's just that instant clash and that instant fire of each other. Um, <laughs> and then you want to just see how that goes from the the rage and the hate to, oh, you ain't so bad after all. Okay, I can kind of get this. Of course. <laughs> Well, that kind of segues perfectly into um, one of my questions from the writing standpoint. Um, you know, Sam and Aaron are both such strong characters in their own right. You know, they're um, extremely intelligent. They're very good at what they're what they do. They're very passionate about what they do. And when they collide, and Sam. I love that she just doesn't hold back. She doesn't care. She, she's, you know, she's going to say what she, she's going to use her voice, say what she wants to say, make sure that she gets her message out and gets her message across to Aaron, especially. Um, but I just love the interactions that they have. And one of the questions that I've really started to enjoy asking is how do you get to know your characters enough during their writing process to be able to let those personalities shine and, and come across for the readers to become invested in them as well. Well, um, my editor probably doesn't want to hear this, but I'm an extremely slow writer, um, <laughs> unfortunately or fortunately. So it gives me a chance to spend a lot of time with my uh, characters as I'm you know, trying to set up these scenarios that I see in my head and translate them into words uh, or, you know, on paper or on my computer screen. So with Aaron, it did take a little bit um, at the beginning because I didn't want him to be just come across as this bad guy or this, you know, this guy that's just pissed off and is going to go stumping like Godzilla through the city. Um, so I wanted him to have a reason for because, you know, he changes his tune pretty quickly once he goes and, and investigates his game. So I wanted there to be a reason um, for him to make that quick change from an enemy to an ally. And um, so I, I, as I was writing him out, he's like, hey, you know, I've got this family and I want to do this cert certification because of my brother and all that we've gone through growing up. I'm like, okay, keep talking. I'm taking notes here, you know, <laughs> as my character's talking to me. So um, him and his family and the background, it just all kind of organically came out as I was uh, writing him and rewriting some scenes. So getting to his why, why he's doing what he's doing, uh, it was just like uncovering treasure, digging for treasure and, and hitting the jackpot. So I really did uh, enjoy just kind of slowly discovering who he was. Now, Samara was, of course, a Samara. I changed my mind on how to pronounce her name all the time. Um, <laughs> so she was a bit more fleshed out because, you know, I knew that she had to, um, like I said, you know, just from listening to and participating and observing in some of the um, things that female gamers have gone through, it made it a lot easier for her. I wanted her to be a champion. Um, I wanted her to stand up. And I wanted her to bring receipts because, you know, people will say that you're just delusional unless you bring the receipts. So I wanted her to bring all the receipts that she could on that. So I knew that she was a firebrand. But then getting to her why um, did take a little bit uh, longer. So when she talks about her friend Marquesa uh, later on in the book, um, that kind of organically popped up. It's like, you know, so why are you doing this? And then she talks about her friend who was doing this before her and how um, that turned to tragedy for her. And so she decided to, you know, take up the banner. Um, so that did come out a little bit uh, easier. Uh, it was still hard to write because, you know, that's some emotional debt <laughs> that you're getting into uh, uh, like that uh, and about the, those kinds of subjects. But um once they told me who they were, it went a lot easier in their interactions with each other as they were finding common ground. And they've got a lot of common ground, as a matter of fact. So it was it was wonderful trying to uh, dig those out and explore those. And I love how you say that your characters talk to you because I feel like that's something that only us writers can really understand when we go, I go outside the world and I'm like, yeah, my characters talk to me. People look at me like, excuse me. 
<laughs> but at the same time, they're the ones you get to know these, you're creating these characters to the point where they feel like flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. when, when you get to that point, the characters just have this extra depth to them because you, you just like, hey, I just ran into so-and-so at the coffee shop, which is your character, you know, and you 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 just like kind of sit and bullshit with them as you're, you know, trying to figure out who they are, what they are, what they're doing and what their purpose is and why they are the way they are. So, yeah, it's like as you, you know, add layer upon layer, they do just become more fully realized as individuals. And I think that that gives your, your character and your writing some extra depth some extra um because you, you you think about how they truly would react in a situation so it's not you thinking they would react this way it's not like you know this character you you've talked to them they've talked back uh, and you know it's like okay so what happens when this is going on and they let you know and it's like okay then that is a scenario that i definitely have to document and um yeah, they all feel real to me until you know I get to the the sagging middle. <laughs> Everybody, you know, like don't talk to me, but please talk to me. It's like you know, just just give me some words so I can put them down on the page, please. Um, yeah, that that sagging middle—that's the bane of everybody's existence. Mm -hmm. I know. Um, mm -hmm. So, and do you have any tips about that saggy middle? Because I like to refer to it as a sticky middle. And I'm currently in the sticky middle for the novel that I'm working on. But for the listeners out there who have to deal, who are writers as well, who have to deal with that sagging middle, do you have any advice for, for them regarding that? Well, for me, I go back to the synopsis because I usually write out a synopsis. And my synopsis is really me just trying to tell the story to my editor um how I think it's going to go because we both know that it's going to change halfway through it anyway um because <laughs> it does and because I'm a I'm a pantser so I write by the seat of my pants but what I do Yay! try to do is, <laughs> oh yeah I'm all about the pantsing I've I've tried to not be a pantser I've tried to plot I I bought index cards and and post-it notes and <laughs> you know the whiteboard and set up a part of my wall and like I'm going to color code it for the characters and everybody and the beats and the heat and what's outside plot and what's internal plot and you know give up after three days so <laughs> I'm just like, okay it's all up in here in my brain and I'm just going to try to get it out as best I can so yeah usually um I will go back through the synopsis and um see where I'm supposed to be in the story and see if I had left myself any nuggets um, of action that is supposed to occur during this point. Um, also, when I was trying to do that plantser thing, plotting and pantsing, um, I tried to have like the three act structure in my brain of what is supposed to, this is supposed to happen in the first part. This is in the second part. And then we're roller coastering down to the end. Um, so yeah, it's it's all up in my brain, but trying to in, put that down on paper or post-it notes <laughs> or whiteboard on the wall, uh, it gets lost somewhere in that in that translation. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I do try to go back through the synopsis or I will uh, definitely try to read like two or three chapters before that that's, um, middle that I get stuck in. And sometimes I'll write ahead. So I'll I'll write like a pivotal scene that leads up to the dark moment or something like that, where there's like a big confrontation or a breakup or something like that. Um, so I'll read and then I backtrack to get back over that middle. So it's like, okay, if you know this is going to happen, then you have to build up to that act, to that scene. So what do you, how are you going to do that? And then that's kind of how I kind of block it off, block out what each character is doing and what they're, saying to each other um to get to that black moment part mm -hmm. now before one thing that you said that I really loved was finding their why and I swear over the course of this podcast we have come up with so many titles for uh 
writing books, like how to write a novel. Diana's favorite one that we like to say is uh, f- there There are many ways to get to 7-Eleven to get your slushy, but uh, <laughs> you don't, in, in terms of plotting, you know, you, that plotting is more like guidelines and there are many ways to get to 7-Eleven, but you're going to get your slushy no matter how, how you get there. But I feel like finding the why is such a great way to to get to know your characters and get to know the plot and get to know so many different facets of the novel is asking yourself why, like just why, why is it happening? Why are they saying that? I think that's a really great way to, to approach that. Absolutely. And I think, like I said before, it just adds a depth to the characters that uh, you probably couldn't get otherwise, or you're going to force something that doesn't quite, sound right in the story and may throw a reader off so yeah I I definitely once I know their why the story becomes a lot easier for me um and knowing how they will react to different situations it does become easier so now of course for romance novel for any novel really but maybe a little more so in romance you have the uh, familiar tropes, and I guess not really just romance novels in general. You, you have the familiar tropes that you're working with. Um, but in uh, you know, Game On, of course, is your, I'm going off script here. I don't have my questions list in front of me right now, and I'm trying to remember exactly how and I did that. <laughs> but um, Game On is your latest novel, of course, but you have a roster of more than 25 novels, and I absolutely have to dive into your paranormal romance novels because, yes, I need that in my life. Um, But when you're sitting down to start a new story, how do you work on kind of you know, using those fam- the familiar scaffoldings of those tropes and making your world and your characters and your story fit across that scaffolding, but in their own unique way to make the reader, to engage the reader and draw them in. Believe it or not, I didn't start to write with tropes already set in place until the love con, which was the book before game on the love con. I knew that I wanted it to get just this trope tastic story. Um, So, you know, friends to lovers, fake dating, only one bed, forced proximity. It's like, whatever it is, let's, let's throw it all in and make, you know, make a, a, put all these ingredients together and make a great cake out of it. Uh, With my paranormal stuff, um, especially the urban fantasy, I just knew that um, I wanted her to be a strong character, but I wanted her to have some vulnerability too. Um, I wanted the uh, hero to be somebody that was worthy of being with her because she's such a strong person uh, in the urban fantasies. Um, so it's like, well, we got this woman who's got this this touch ability where she can, you know, find out all kinds of things about uh, objects and stuff, but she can also, um, you know, it could have a detrimental effect on people. Um, so it's like, well, if you got a person like this, then who could possibly uh, be the match for them? And that's how I came up with Kafar. It's like, he's been around the block. I mean, yeah, most 4,000 year old men have been around the block a time or two. <laughs> you know, you know the, there's very little that's going to phase them. So, um, and because I'm, I just love Egyptian mythology so much, I just made him a follower of Isis and that, uh, and then like the, the sun god trope where if he dies, he's got to be facing east, facing the rising sun. So the rising sun uh, hits him and then he comes back to life, which I know is just kind of a weird thing, but I'm like, I can make it work. We're going to make this work. And once they got together, it's like, well, okay, it does work. Um, But yeah, uh, the tropes just kind of come come up as I'm writing and it's like, oh, that's what I'm doing. (laughs) Pretty much the the whole pantser thing, you know, comes back and bites me in the butt. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of just discover what the tropes are as I'm writing and as I'm coming up with scenarios, um, that's when I figured, um, oh yeah, let's, let's 
let's throw this one in and see how this works with them. So I've had some scenes where it just didn't work. And I've had some scenes where, oh, this is much better than what I wrote before. So we're going to go with this. Because, um, <laughs> you know, sometimes when you get stuck, you have to rewrite a scene sometimes uh, if it just isn't popping like you want it to pop. So that's when you do examine your tropes or examine, you know, the scenes that you're putting together and see what about it is not popping the way that you know these characters can and so that's when you you know I go to the trope dictionary <laughs> and, and try to <laughs> see which ones uh would uh fit the story and then it's like oh okay well that's kind of what I was doing anyway so now I know the name for it so let's go ahead and do it <laughs> and I know I'm sounding like I haven't written 25 books over 24 <laughs> years um Oh, yeah. oh my God! Yes, it's been twenty four years uh, since the first book. Um, and I rambled on so much, I forgot the the what we were talking about. Oh, tropes and, <laughs> and <laughs> yes, I find them by rambling on incessantly. That's how it happens. <laughs> well, I think that's like an essential as a fellow pantser. That is an essential part of the pantsing process is is you know exploring and letting the characters just kind of like do do their thing and mm -hmm. and you know every now and then you say wait hold on we're, we're not going that way no that's not going to work we have to come back this way and, and try that street <laughs> yes sometimes it's like hurting the cats or in my case my dogs who are who are furry toddlers uh <laughs> those super tantrums uh for some reason, they're not in here now, and I'm so very grateful that they're not. Okay, so let's not talk them up. But yes. <laughs> but yes, so, and, the characters are like that. I know we're just about coming up at our time, but one thing we've uh, started asking at the end of our episodes, which I have really been loving, is what are you reading right now? What What books are you absolutely loving as a reader, not a writer. I knew you were going to ask me that, and I should have had my stack. <laughs> should have had my stack. The, the the in process of reading versus the to be read, because of course nobody can move that stack. Um, so let's look. Uh, I'm reading a couple of Sarah Desai's books, The Marriage Game, and the um, the one that came before that. Sarah Rashan is one I always love to read. So her um, her Disney book, but also the uh, the uh oh see she's gonna kick me because I can't remember the title of her book. Uh the dating playbook. Whew, that was it. <laughs> oh, glad I don't play on game shows because I would just like freeze and go bleh. Um but like that. Um Olivia Wade, I like a lot of her stuff. Um and, and Olivia Dade as well. Um but uh, I haven't read anything in paranormal in a while and I'm so very sad about that because I love paranormal too. Um, that's, that's you know, I read historicals and then I went into paranormal. And once I fell into paranormal, I pretty much stayed there and just wallowed in it because I just love paranormal romances. I love how people do their takes on um, all of the different paranormal creatures that are out there, and it made me want to do my own takes on them. So, um, those are some of the ones that I've been reading lately. Um, and of course, there's many, many more that I've bought that are just sitting on my Kindle waiting for me to one day, hopefully get the time. <laughs> to crack I'll come Kindle. back for you. Yeah. I feel like I have to keep one of those, like I, I have my story graph and I don't keep my TBR list on story graph because it's like immense, but I have to keep my Kindle books on story graph so that I can remind myself, oh yeah, I've got that book downloaded and I should be reading that book because you download them and then you forget them right at least I know I do and you know when, when I'm reading romances and especially contemporary ones I can't I can't read them and write at the same time because I don't want any bleed through inadvertent or not uh or I don't want it to seem like there was some um copying um of ideas and um, anything like that. So I usually don't read them but again slow writer here so of course <laughs> <laughs> there's stuff that's sitting on there that's like six years old because I haven't <laughs> gotten a chance to come back to it because I just head down in a book because slow writer. 
Seriously, um, I'm so glad that you brought that up because I said that once and somebody looked at me like I was weird because I did that. I, I've been writing Italian historical fiction and I try to avoid that time period in historical fiction because I don't want any of that, like you said, that bleed through. And I actually said it to an Italian author once and she just looked at me like I was nuts. But there is that that factor with it that we do as authors, we do take on bits like, oh, you know, Sarisia, I'm sorry, uh, said that and it was fantastic. You know, the way she wrote that, it was fantastic. I love the way she did this dialogue. I'm going to do something similar for my book. And we always do that, regardless of whether or not we it's a, the same genre. Very true. But sometimes when it is in that same genre, genre while we're writing a novel, it can be, it, you can't have too much of that bleed through. Right. I feel like you have to kind of put a gauze over your reading and say, okay, this is what I'm reading now. And I'll read this once I'm done with this book. Exactly. That's exactly how it is. Well, everyone, if you would like to get your own copy of Game On, it is out in the world, and you can always check out our show notes to click on the link to our bookshop on bookshop.org to order your own copy. As always, bookshop.org supports our incredible writers. It supports the podcast, but most importantly, it supports all the wonderful indie bookstores out there. And Sarisia, thank you so much for making time for us and coming to hang out. We've had such a blast chatting with you. Thank you. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. And enjoy the rest of your evening. You too. Thanks. Bye. Bye.